It's wonderful to be back, day two of the World Government Summit, and to our panel today, One Earth, Women Leading Sustainability. What happens when we elevate the visibility, the leadership, and the collective impact of women leading a more sustainable future? Answer, things get done. That is not to suggest that men don't get things done as well. Of course they do. But research shows a clear link between women's leadership and pro-environment outcomes. That is a fact. A 2021 report suggests countries with a higher proportion of women in government are more likely to ratify international treaties, create protected areas, and pursue more robust climate change policies. Women's leadership is good for the planet. None of this will come as a surprise to the three women I have on my panel today, three female powerhouses intent on driving long-term solutions to protect and regenerate our planet. Razan, Yasmin, and Khadija. <clears throat> I want to get your, and it's been fascinating listening to um, uh, the panels before us. I want to get your personal perspectives, if I can, on how important it has been for each of you to have a seat at the top table. Rosanne, you are the UN Climate Change High Level Champion for COP28. That's quite a title. You are also only the second woman to ever lead the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, as president in its 75-year history. And its first president from West Asia, you have spent your career imbued in the world of sustainability and the environment. So let's start with you, if we can. Just how important is it for you that you have had that seat at the top table? Having a seat at the table um, confirms a couple of things. It confirms that you can't achieve socio-economic progress without the participation of women. It, uh, it also uh, demonstrates that you can't actually achieve sustainable development without the participation and empowerment of, of women. And closer to the work that I do, you can't address the, the twin crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss uh, without women. Let's look at it also in, um, on another light. Women and girls are disproportionately impacted by climate change and uh, biodiversity loss. Why? Because they are on the front lines mm. of those twin issues. And because they are on the front lines of these twin issues, they are really uniquely positioned to think about the necessary solutions. Their rhetoric, from my experience, is action. It's not inaction. Their rhetoric is pragmatism. And their rhetoric is finding opportunities in these solutions. And that is why, from a COP28 perspective, mm. from a priorities perspective, adaptation is key. Mm. Because women are disproportionately impacted by climate change, our adaptation strategies, our adaptation financing needs to ensure that we reach women on the front lines. And I'll stop there. Um, Thank you, Razan. Um, Yasmin, your country sits at the heart of the climate change crisis, as does Khadija's, as does the UAE. So I think it's so important that you guys are here today, not just talking about climate change and the environment, but living through what is, you know, a potential nightmare and, and working to ensure that we alleviate that. So yes, I mean, just Given your experience, um, you supported the Earth Institute in designing a center of excellence for adaptation to climate change. You've been keenly involved in two climate change initiatives, the African Adaptation uh, Initiative and the African Renewable Energy 
initiative. Um, picking up from where Razan left off, what has been your experience of getting to and being at the top table? Um, I think it's, it is something for me, from the, my personal perspective, uh, an experience is to make a real change mm. in the sustainability and environment in Egypt. Uh, working within that sector for more than 25 years since I first graduated, I wanted to make a change. Mm. Being enabled and being selected as the Minister of Environment and then working as the President for COP14 on the biodiversity mm. as well as the envoy for COP27 gave me more strength to do the real things that any woman, even not as a minister, mm. would face in her daily life. Mm. How can women manage their daily life, their children? How can they integrate sustainability more? How can we conserve water? How can we turn our lights off mm. when we leave the room in, in our houses? You know, these regular things mm. that you face, you want to make that kind of a change. So being there at the cabinet, and being allowed even at the international level to lead on those positions would give more uh, enabling environment and more power that you mm. are able to do that. And it takes a lot of effort mm. really to change How big a struggle that. has it been? The struggle was a lot, the struggle, because the sustainability as a struggle is very difficult to mainstream, even if you mm. are able to observe that, mm. because there is always that conflict between the development and the conservation of natural resources. But as a woman, because being so much persistent, committed, having even colleagues that are there being really mm. believing in the thing within the ministry, we were able to make it done one cup after the other, one thing after the other. It was really being able to lead with the process and with the consultation mm. participation as Rosanna has been mentioned. Yeah. I mean, the goals of uh, the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement rely on advancing local and regional sustainable development, and that must be equitable and inclusive. And as you have pointed out, Razan, you know, women sit in the crosshairs of this climate and biodiversity crisis. Khadija, you know, you're from the Maldives. Um, the fact that sustainability has been sort of normalized within the policy agenda uh, for countries around the world now must be must have been music to the ears of anybody who who uh, who has been born and brought up in the in the Maldives. Just j just give me a sense of 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 your journey and the importance you believe of having a seat at the top table. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be on the panel with um, with my colleagues here discussing this important topic. So the Maldives is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change, and um, we face the impacts of sea level rise. We are really on the front lines. There's also 82 months left until 2030, which means if we overshoot the 1.5, the impacts are re very real. So the Maldives is one, we have 187 inhabited islands and 200 resorts, and the rest are un uninhabited. And recently, we have um, implemented the Decentralization Act in the Maldives, so there's regional governance mechanisms. And we have mandated by law that a third of our local councils should include women. And we also have women's um, councils on each island, and there's a reason why we're making this mandatory by law even, because we are an island nation that relies on fishing and tourism. The men go out um, on the sea for fishing and, and, and they work in the resorts. When we have climate impacts and disasters hit, the women are left on the islands and they have to face um, with the disaster risk response and they also have to take care of the household and the family. So we'll only be able to strengthen our resilience if only we are able to empower our women with the skills, with also the ability to do gender responsive climate um, response, their ability to um, be more active in the local economy, and, and their ability to just generally strengthen the well-being of the community. So for us, it's really important that women are not statistics, that we tick off on our different climate projects, because the Maldives, of course, receives climate uh, finance to implement development and uh, climate resilience 
in initiatives, and we don't want us to be in a box, but we want women to have the agency to take decisions for their communities and raise girls and women who could actively participate in building the nation and strengthening our resilience because we are going into a climate uncertain future. Mm. Well, let, let's talk about COP28 if we can then, because it's, it, uh, you know, the idea that ensuring that women aren't just statistics, that, that women are, you know, in, heavily involved in, in, in the narrative and the, and the solutions here. How are you prioritizing women across the, uh, the COP28 process, meeting, and, and what are the priorities beyond? I would say the priority is because it's a necessity. Mm. So we talk about climate change and its impacts, and we know that women and girls are going to be impacted disproportionately. Mm -hmm. So how do we address that from a COP28 presidency? We need to ensure and align support from an adaptation perspective reaches women. And that is a challenge because of a, lot, a lot of the times, women are statistics but they're not integrated within particular institutions to be able to receive the support that they require. So take, for example, farmers, rural farmers. More than half of global rural farmers are women, but most of these women have no rights to their lands, are not registered with respect to wage uh, submission, mm. and therefore are going to be if not by design, will be left behind with respect to um, support from an adaptation perspective. Mm. But the other significant priority for COP28 has to do with this elusive 1.5 degree Celsius target. So how does the world achieve 1.5? By necessity, women have to be drivers to achieve mm. these targets. Now, the target is 1.5. It can only be achieved by three mechanisms. Number one, diversify away from fossil fuels into renewable and low-carbon technologies. Number two, efficiency across the board. And number three, protection of nature and protection of mm -hmm. carbon sinks. Mm -hmm. Through these three mechanisms, you can draw down carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. But it's not, but the mechanisms are enabled by the new economy. The new economy is not just electricity, it's mobility, it's food, it's uh, urban planning, it's agri-tech. Now, if we don't, if we're not careful, we can create biases for the true inclusion of women in the new green economy. Mm -hmm. So who's doing the training? If at the moment, the training is primarily being done by fossil fuel companies um, to uh, transition to cleaner economies. Mm -hmm. But if the numbers at those firms are predominantly men, women will be left out. Access to capital we need to ensure women will have access to a capital so that they enter this new green economy. So it's really important that we recognize that climate action cannot exclude women. And this is another priority mm. for the COP28 presidency. Mm. You've just been through um, Yasmin COP27, and I've, um, the audience is aware, keenly aware of your experience. So as we talk about the absolute priority that the UAE is putting on a sort of rights-based transition, what's been your experience to date of where we are on that journey? Um, I think that we're still struggling on the rights to have that access to land, access to capital, mm. uh, not in the positioning of the women in different uh, mm. leadership or even the idea of women having the equal opportunities to jobs. For example, when they are doing the protection of land or they are even fighting land degradation, they're still having that opportunity. But the right that they would be able to sustain having that land and the right to access to finance is really crucial. And for that reason, we thought uh, during our journey in COP27 that having an initiative on uh, women adaptive capacity, 
is extremely mm. important mm. with the focus and the zooming of water, food, and energy to give more opportunity for women to have access to finance, to land, to be able to sustain their practices, to build their own capacity for being more resilient to floods, to heat waves, mm. and all that stuff. Mm. I covered COP27, and of course, we'll be heavily involved in mm. COP28. Um, Khadija, loss and damage um, was clearly a, a huge driver um, and a great success, I have to say, um, out of COP27. We still need the kind of meat on the bone, as it were. I mean, but at least getting it as an item agenda in the first <laughs> instance and then, uh, and, and then being focused on ensuring that we follow through on that is, is so important. It was the developing nations, the small island nations, that got a seat at the table at COP27. I know, Roseanne, you will absolutely ensure that they are uh, well represented here. And I have to say, outside of this region, the last two COPs, it worried me that the small island nations, the developing world and the emerging um, economies weren't as well represented as they might be. We. Let's look forward here. We've, we've heard about some priorities. We've, we've, learned, we've talked about where we are at on the journey for a rights-based, gender-based um, transition. What do you want to see prioritized this year and beyond? When you, when you think about your, you know, your own country, um, the experience that you've had growing up there and representing both the women and men of your country. What do you want to see? What do you want to see as an outcome? Thank you. So is the Maldives is one of the, uh, one of the frontline nations. We really, want, we really want the global goal on adaptation to really be concluded in, in the COP in UAE. And we also want uh, movement with the transitional, with the establishment of the transitional committee um, for loss and damage mm. as well. And by this, I mean, with the global goal on adaptation, it's so important for countries like us because we actually don't want to deal with loss and damage. We want to adapt and increase our adaptive capacities to better address the underlying risks in areas of food, biodiversity, health, um, water, and also infrastructure. And we really think that women will also play a very important role in ensuring our well-being so that we are able to do transformational adaptation and development that would enable us to better deal with loss and damage in the future when it strikes. Otherwise, we'll be going from cycle to cycle, from disaster to disaster, and each disaster would actually set us back in, in our development journey. And what we have achieved so far in the Maldives, we have achieved tremendous development progress. And if we are to be focusing our limited budget and resources on addressing the climate disasters, We'll be spending less on education, we'll be spending less on health and on social protection. And the social protection and welfare is so important, mm. actually, in the climate crisis, in, in our resilience to be able to live in a climate uncertain future. So we really hope the GGA, the Global Goal on Adaptation, is actually um, uh, the work program can be concluded in um, COP28, and we also really hope that the loss and damage is something that's very complicated, mm. of course, and, and we're talking about climate finance here. And we really hope that we're able to discuss and move forward with the different uh, funding arrangements, the capitalization of funds, and how the international financial structure could actually benefit the process within the UNFCCC. We're going to have to work very hard yeah. to lean on some of the biggest and richest countries in the world to ensure they pony up when it comes to loss and damage. Believe me, at CNN, we'll be, uh, we'll be making, that, uh, m making some noise about that. Razan, I'm going to leave uh, the last... Um, sort of minute or so, we're out of time actually, but I'm gonna give you an extra minute or 90 seconds. I was at COP27 with you <clears throat> with, and I'm sure many of them are in the room here. In fact, I've just seen Maythru, as I understand, is one of these, with a, a whole group of young female negotiators. Um, it was 
it literally the hair stood up in the back of my hands when I saw uh, this group of youngsters. It was terrific to see. I, I'm absolutely sure that you've been part of the kind of driving force to ensure that the UAE, alongside the UN, um, has women not just talking at, about and at the table of you know, the climate crisis uh, narrative, but young female negotiators at the heart of what we hope will be some significant progress here. Do you want to just, uh, uh, just sort of close out with, uh, with that? No, I am incredibly proud um, to be a part of this new female caliber that we see coming out of the Arab region. And like you said, not on the periphery, but really leading mm. the negotiations. And really, you know, I was listening to the speaker beforehand, um, demonstrating the values of collaborative thinking, mm. the values of empathy, because you can't engage on climate change if you do not acknowledge certain truths, certain truths that some countries are facing much more loss and damage than others. Mm. And there are responsibilities that are placed on the shoulders of those who are able to support financially, and technically, but acknowledgement is extremely important. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, climate change is a complex um, uh, challenge. Um, it's a, um, a whole of world problem mm. that will require a whole of society engagement to address those, uh, those, those challenges. Um, having women at the front, at the center, leading those efforts is a recipe for success that we would like to carry over for the COP28. Good luck. We're pulling for you. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. That was absolutely fascinating.